I now request Professor Ravindra Prasad to give the keynote address. Let me make a couple of uh, preliminary observations. Firstly, I think I joined Professor Prasad, B.S. Prasad, and I say I'm also Prasad and he's also Prasad, both from Usmania. Uh, he say he congratulated the Department of Public Administration and Political Science for the organizing seminar. I joined him because in India, Indian universities, I don't know how many universities are there latest, maybe 400 or 500. I think hardly a few universities may be having urban uh, studies as part of their postgraduate or uh, undergraduate studies. In that respect, uh, urban studies is a neglected subject. And therefore, the university, without having the urban specialization, organizing a seminar is welcome from that perspective. I congratulate uh, the Mr. Professor Rahmatullah and his colleagues. And uh, thank the Vice Chancellor for his unstinted support for this effort. And also thank uh, Rahmatullah and his team for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts of mine. When uh, Rahmatullah asked me, I had a problem because he said democratic decentralization in urban areas for good governance and sustainable development. I think I don't have to repeat what was said by Prasad. It consists of four different subjects, urbanization, democratic decentralization, good governance, and sustainable development. Then I thought, when I saw the brochure, but it's slightly, slightly different. Different, it covers a wider gamut of uh, urban affairs, urban governance, and urban development. So I had a word with Rahmatullah, and then I thought I can cover the uh, dimensions, uh, different dimensions rather than only covering on democratic decentralization, which is a little bit, I thought, a uh, narrow subject. At this point, I, I was reminded of a story. A few professors of philosophy were asked to visit China and study the Chinese philosophy and come back. On their return, I understand the university professor said, you please tell us what you have learned about Chinese philosophy during your visit. And the, Chinese, the professors of philosophy said half an hour about China, another half an hour about uh, philosophy, and then sat down, leaving the rest to the fellow colleagues to uh, view them together. So I thought probably I can do the same here. That is urbanization, urban governance, decentralization, and sustainable development. I leave the, and leave the rest, rest of it to your intellect to view them together. Friends, I'm conscious that we are talking to the professors of political science and public administration from different universities. We have to be. Now, despite these limitations, I make, uh, I, decided to make a PowerPoint presentation, which is easy for me. I discussed four aspects, as I said earlier, that is urbanization, it's context, changing context of urbanization to which references have already been made. As a matter of fact, Professor Prasad has given theoretical aspects of uh, the uh, title of this talk, uh, today's this, uh, national seminar, and also Professor Rahmatullah. As an empiricist, I'll, I would like to give a little bit more of details, uh, maybe statistics boring you, uh, as to how to borrow what Prasad has said, the implementation is weak. Some policies are there, but implementation is weak. I would use the word disastrously weak as we, so, uh, as we go through uh, the presentation. Uh, second, we'll discuss about uh, urban challenges. What are the services the city people get? What are the levels of poverty? How the governance is being made? Then discuss about the number of policies that have been articulated during the last 30, 40 years, what are the problems, and then what lies ahead. And finally, probably, the role the university can pay, more so the central universities like uh, Morana Azad uh, University. Friends, you can, uh, probably it can, you can avoid. Friends, the, as you all, most of you are aware, the, today we are living in an urban century. In the sense, more than 50% of the world are living in urban areas. Gone are the days where rural is the uh, uh, system, but today it's more than 20, 50% of the people from 2009 onwards are living in urban areas. Therefore, this is called an urban century and arrival of an urban millennium. Now, urban areas across the country, across the globe, contribute almost in developed countries 85% of the GDP. Even less developed countries, 55% of the GDP. 
that thereby signifying urban development or urban areas contribution to which a reference was made earlier. Now, urban growth is phenomenal during the last few decades. As we see, <coughs> by 2050, it is said <coughs> almost 70 to 80 percent of the people will be living in urban areas. So this, this, this makes us to ponder over, can we in the universities continue to neglect urban studies, urban discourse? Well, friends, the where the, the growth of urban areas is, uh, um, urban population is growing, more so in developing countries. If you look at the, the, uh, the growth pattern, see in some countries, the urbanization is decreasing, whereas in India, urbanization is increasing. From 39%, 26%, even in China, it was two, the almost 3% annual growth coming down to 1.31, uh, whereas in India, it is 87 to 146. So India is growing, urbanizing much faster. This has some implications for policy. This has implications for uh, uh, programs, implementation, governance, decentralization, sustainable development, and so on and so forth. This is how, if India, world is going to 80%, uh, 60, 70%, and India is not, not lagging behind. 55% of the urban people will be living in urban areas in next three or four decades. Well, this is the growth of urban, India's urban growth. Much faster, it is growing. Well, if you look at this, almost 18% was rural growth into 91 to 2001, but today it is only 12% declining, whereas, Urban growth is much faster, it is 31-32%. These factors explain how the uh, urban growth is taking place. If you look at the previous, if, if you look at some states, the growth, how growths are taking place. Kerala, which had only 25% urban, ur 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 urbanism, has in a decade of 10, day, 10 years practically, has become almost 50% urban. The growth is substantial, almost 25%. Since several st uh, states, the growth is very high. That means several states are growing much faster. Some are, of course, growing so. Well, some projections say by next 20 years, five states in India will have almost 60 to 70% living in urban areas. Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Punjab and Kerala, Karnataka, and other states like uh, Andhra Pradesh and Haryana and one or two other states also are on the verge of 47, 48 percent urban. The why I am showing giving the statistics is that urbanization is just not it is a topic to be discussed, but to be taken very seriously in terms of public policy and so on and so forth. Take for example, it is said roughly every every 30 minutes, every, uh, every minute, 30 Indians are added to the urban areas today. Every minute, 30 Indians are added to the urban scene. Look at the complexity of the problem. Of these people, almost 42% of the people, there are 55 metropolitan areas, that is more than 10, uh, 10 lakh population. They are likely to reach almost 90 in the next two decades. 15% of the entire country's population is living in these 50 urban areas. So, most important is, as we shall see, it is not the countries and states which are competing, it is cities which are competing today for investments, for growth. As Prasad has said earlier, Hyderabad is, is the most important content, contentious issue between uh, Telangana and Andhra because it has more than a crore population, roughly about 80, 80, 80, 90 lakhs. It is expected in the next few years it may cross a crore of population. What are its implications? What are its implications? What does what, what this urban uh, growth imply? <clears throat> we have many challenges. We have many, many, many challenges. Challenges in terms of structural challenges as well as implementation challenges. Now, density is another issue, one issue. Some, cit some cities are highly dense. <coughs> Take, for example, Mumbai and Calcutta have higher density than some of the advanced, uh, some of the develop, uh, other countries like Paris or London or UK uh, uh, or New York. 
Similarly, unbalanced growth, brownfield development, not greenfield development. These are some of the issues. Then issues of execution, which is catastrophically is very poor ex execution of programs and policies. In India, if you take, we do not have an urban policy. Transparency is totally absent in the system at the local level. Accountability is weak. Large number of institutions are created which quarrel among themselves as to how to implement the programs rather than implement the programs themselves. And more important is capacity. There is no capacity for the people who are implementing this program or executing these programs. Policy makers are not interested. The execution, executing agency have no interest or do not have the capacity. What then is the problem? Next, friends. If you look at the services, water is available only to 70% if you take entire country. And in some states, it is far less, less than 50%. Mind you, if $1 we spend on water, we'll get back the returns of $35 per capita. But we are not spending on water. Some, st some, some states have low coverage of water supply. Then you take toilets. I think during the last uh, two years, after this uh, uh, census 2011, a lot of discussion is taking place as to what is access to toilets. Only 80% have, less than 80% have access to toilets. Friends, today, more than 20% of population defecate in the open is a shame on India's urban systems, urban governance. And Ramatullah is talking about sustainable development. See, if 20% of people are openly defecating in urban areas, I'm not talking rural areas. And in India, to the best of my knowledge, only one city is there in West Bengal that's called Kalyani Municipality, which seem to have achieved the status of no open defecation city. The second city which I visited recently is Navi Mumbai, near Mumbai. No city has in India, except Kalyani, has the distinction of becoming open defecation free. What, are, what, what then we are delivering to the people? Well, several states, no access to toilets, look at it. 25, 30% in Bihar, Odisha, more than in Chhattisgarh, 40% of people do not have access to toilets. Same is, similar is the case with uh, water supply. Many per people do not have water in their premises. If in Chhattisgarh, I have visited maybe 20, 25 village, uh, towns, municipalities in Chhattisgarh. More than 50% people do not have uh, water in their premises. Well, first time in India, states have been made to publicize, publish what are the status of infrastructure, services that are delivering to the people in 2011, mandated by the 13th Finance Commission. Well, friends, it gives, you, it gives us a very sad story. And mind you, this data is published data by the state governments in their state gazette, gazettes, which means it's authentic data. But our own studies have shown it is authentic to the extent it's published in, in a state gazette, but reliability is, in most cases, lowest. That means this data is concocted data. Look at, even the published data also do not talk high. Water is supposed to be 100% as per the benchmarks in India or elsewhere. But in Bihar, only 17% have water uh, connections. See, 100% one has to cover, but only 17% is covered. Even other states like Ojisa is 25%. Same is the case in terms of per capita water supply. For a sustained live life, if not a good quality of life for a normal life, one requires 135 per, uh, uh, liters per day for each individual. But look at, even the national average is only 75, 75. That is half of it. And in some states, mind you, if you look at come down, it is far low. 45, 29 in Bihar, 49 in Chhattisgarh. How can people live without water? Friends, this all gives you. 
they all gives you in different places what are the services solid waste drainage explains the delivery of services the awfully inadequate delivery of services well friends some of the projections say we need 56 oh, sorry we need 83 billion liters of water per day we are producing only 56 billion liters of water but in the next 20 years by 1930, we need 189, but at the present rate of development, it is less than 50%. Similarly is the case sewage. We are treating, we are uh, treating not even one-fifth of the sewage, but future is much more awful. Transport, if you take, anywhere, anywhere in the world, minimum 70% of the tra uh, transport is provided by the public transport. But in India, it's 25 to 30. That explains how we are living. What are the problems? Congestion, hazards. Every day we find in Hyderabad, anywhere in city. Sometimes people say, if you go by uh, car, it will take three hours. If you do by train, it will take two hours. That is it. So now look at the poverty, latest po uh, po poverty details. Mind you, friends, even today, technically it may be 20%. In urban areas, though rural areas, it is 35%. Now, you know, I don't have to go into details. 35 rupees is the, or 32 rupees, whatever is the case, per capita per day, for the, for the people to live. A lot of debate is going on, and we are all part of the debate, discussing the debate. I am not going into those detailed debate, but assuming that 32 rupees is sufficient, even then, more than less than 20, 30, 20 people, urban people are living in. Most tragic is the per capita, the government of India decided, our planning commission has decided, is the same for Mumbai, Calcutta, and a small town near uh, Urdu University, maybe Rajendranagar or some other place. One has to live with 30, 32 rupees in Mumbai, that includes everything, and same is the case with Rajendranagar, which is close to Hyderabad, or in a small down with 30,000 population or 20,000 population. How, how, do, how are you able to work, live? So poverty is another dimension. Well, friends, one dimension that we are finding is nowadays, during the last 10, 15 years, in the past, poverty used to be more in the rural areas and then less in urban areas. But today, what we call urbanization of poverty. Poverty in some states is getting urbanized. Of the total poor in the state, state, as per the statistics, if you take exit, that the statistics are correct. Even in Delhi, rural poverty is seven, urban poverty is 14. You may say, is the, uh, are there any uh, uh, rural areas in Delhi, but it's in the, in the capital. Look at them, some of the cities. Haryana, Himachal Pradesh. So some urban poverty is increasing phenomenally thereby signifying something seriously wrong with policies, seriously wrong with administration, seriously wrong with what we have been doing. Well, you look at it. For the last 20 years, if you take uh, 35 five years, poverty remains the same between urban and rural. 81% rural in 73, 78% in rural in 2009-10. I'm going by statistics, though I don't agree with them. That means poverty efforts are not adequate or do not exist. Otherwise, out of, out of, uh, of, after 35, 40 years, because the data is available from 73-74, uh, almost 40 years, how come the same level of poverty remains in this country? Well, friends, first time, uh, the slum census was uh, made in 2001, but only day before, that is on Friday, census office has released some data on slums. Not report is not fully available. Well, friends, to my shock, probably you'll also be shocked when I say, of the 4,000 urban local bodies in India, 2000, uh, only 2,500 said we have slums. Rest of the state said we don't have slums. This is. Friends, day before yesterday, census has released data, and they said only 
66, 65% of the municipalities have said we have slums, but 37% of water it is. That is more than 30%, more than one third. Said we don't have slums. Two census, not a survey, a survey done by me or somebody else. Well, I have, reference, I have reason to talk about these things because probably at the end of it, I make a couple of references to that. And if you look at it, and of the slums, metros have almost 40 percent, more than a more than a 10 lakh population have more than 30, uh, 40 percent of the population. Well, friends, more than five, like top five states are Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, and Kerala is one state which said only 1.5 percent. Should we not study the mechanisms, delivery mechanisms, policies, programs, implementation, etc.? Well, similarly, if you look at the states, sorry, cities, I, I think first time, earlier it was 55% were uh, slum people in 2001 census, but today it's only 44, 43%, I think 40, 44%. No, I'm sorry, it's 41%. But Visakhapatnam in Andhra Pradesh has a distinction of being the city with almost half the population living in slums. One reason may be, nowadays there is a, there is a, a trend has started across the country all the rural areas are being added to the cities for a variety of reasons. Therefore, all villages, by definition, are slums without access to anything. Because there's no data is available. Recently, we have found in Warangal, which is close to Hyderabad, almost 25 villages are added. And when we go to the villages, there's nothing. No road, no drainage. Seabase is... Now we can't even talk about, therefore, all of them. So this is one reason as to why some of these Visakhapatnam have this distinction. Well, friends, oh, come in. Okay, okay, next. Well, census also brought out some studies on access to services, which was not the case so far, first time after independence. Now they say water is, and this gives you a very interesting reading to students of political science and public administration, social scientists. Look at it, water in premises is the, is the benchmark. Now, 71% has urban areas and the slums are 56%. That means not only in slum people, but even in the main, main city also, many people do not have access to water in their houses. A few days back, uh, a group of uh, officials came to uh, ASCII for some training urban people. We asked them, how many hours do you get water? First, they couldn't understand the question. What is this? What, what is this water? How many hours? What do, you, what do you mean? We told them we get once in two days. And in, in, each day we get a couple of hours if we are lucky. Then he said, no, we never heard about it. Water is there 24 hours. No, but here we don't have. Same is the case. Power, 92% have urban and 90% Drainage, closed drains are there only in 36%. Open drains, 45%. Latrines, again, I have discussed earlier. So, friends, this explains census, mind you, and that is the basis for allocations, policy making, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for the next 10 years. Even if the data is not correct. Well, we have. Been making some efforts uh, as far as the policies are concerned. Kerala has done fairly good in case of poverty. Originally, they thought by 2008 they must eliminate poverty in urban areas and rural areas in Kerala, but they have extended it. They have institutional mechanisms. Andhra also is doing it. Several livelihood and etc. are working, but they are still not functional. Well, friends, let's come back to uh, governance, the second part of it. Yes. Well, I think Prasad already said it. I don't have to go take. No, next. Next. No, previous. Well, it is not, is the government was not the only, is not the only institution which is delivering services today to the people. Gone are the days where we look for only to the local body. All urban services, all, I, when I say all, all urban services, from water to CVS to drainage, everything, are also being done by the private sector. 
the planning commission promotes private sector participation in urban uh, uh, service provision service delivery civil society so these are also institutions laws delivery mechanisms etc etc well i don't go into details of uh, prasad has said uh, quoting from uh, world bank and imf and un the good governance this is what we supposed to be providing in urban areas that is transparency accountability responsiveness rule of law etc etc but if you look back what have you seen for last 10 minutes that is what is that available drainage is not there then explains where is rule of law where is transparency where is accountability to whom they are accountable well accountability is one major issue now from the same thing we have also oh, refined uh, talk of good urban governance same principles were added a little bit more that includes also promotion of local economic development for livelihoods for bread and butter of the poor in sitting in urban areas we need to have local level it's not service of water and service of uh, sewerage etc etc but something more that needs to be done today in urban scene because with urbanization new trends are appearing one is mind you reduce state intervention state says privatize outsource what are its consequences we have seen earlier but probably will be seen now increase the private sector water delivery in nagpur is in a couple of years will be totally done by private sector not by the local body hubli we have seen where water was available for 14 days once a 14 days private sector was given they said they are providing water 24 hours but then we have to see after 2 years whether they will be 24 hours or what are the water charges etc etc but this is the national scene outsourcing i have seen municipalities in several parts of the country in several states only four or five are municipal employees all others are outsourced employees no accountability no capacity nothing about urban systems understanding land i think a reference was made environmental issues civil society social capital and so on and so forth well friends our governments are ch challenges are many now private sector is being invited to do the job but there is no mechanism to control them to regulate them whatever they do is final unless there is a mechanism we know in power sector if mechanism is there what's going to happen but still chatisgarh is the only state to the best of my knowledge which has started urban regulatory body but it's not functional for last 4 years same is the case with limited policy mind you we don't have in india even today despite urban growth no urban policy we do not know how to locate where to locate what to locate why to locate how to deliver when to deliver what to deliver same is the case in uh, administrative aspects also over but in metropolises we have been advising the municipal corporation of mumbai in municipal corporation of mumbai commissioner don't know what's happening in his in his forget about what like you and me sitting aside doing even commissioners do not know they are looking out for outside agencies to come and tell them what they should do well friends multiplicity of agencies i have seen in hyderabad in many parts of the country many many states which i visited state government has to arbitrate between two urban agencies to deliver services in the same city i know chief minister of andhra pradesh a few years back negotiating between urban development authority and municipal corporation of hyderabad what a farce same is the case there is no professional management friends in many states urban managers are drawn from the civil services but there are no professionals maybe it may be news to you for some of you at least solid waste management is not being done in india by the environmental engineers but by doctors <laughs> many many parts of the country just now awareness is coming
there is real talent in the country, accountability mechanisms. India is poor on five or six of these parameters. Of go go good governance we are talking about. If good governance is rule of law, empowerment, etc., etc., and all of them in uh, urban governance. I'm talking about this is urban, not rural. Well, friends, this is the context. As I said, there is no urban policy in India. No, no doubt that there are some efforts were made a couple of times, but because of uh, problems, it was, it was given up. No, it was not articulated. In the absence of that, we have these four major interventions, you may say, or policy, or program, or scheme, or is. Friends, we all, students of political science, public administration, or history, talk about Lord Ripon's resolution of 1882, Lord Mayer's of 19, uh, 1870, and so on and so forth. It took India 100 years, more than 100 years, 74th Amendment of Constitution, 1994. 100 years, probably, we are working on the same Lord Ripon's resolution, or Mayer's resolution, or Minto Morley reforms, or 1919 Act, or whatever is the case. 74th Constitution, all is most of you are aware, and there is a full session on that. Maybe I'll spend a little time on that. Then JNURM, a program with, uh, with 50,000 crores of money to be spent on projects and reforms. And 13th Finance Commission reforms we'll discuss about. These three or four for a, to explain about the governance system in India. Well, there are a few policies like National Urban Sanitation Policy. We realized in 2008, after 50 years, when people are talking about urban defecation, he said, we have urban sanitation policy, capacity building policy, housing policy. Mind you, in 1998, national slum policy was prepared. Today is 2013. The national slum policy has not yet seen the light. Whether slums are to the governors that be, is a priority or not, slum population is a are human beings are not is a matter of detail. We don't go into these details. Now, friends, these three or four things are closely relevant, which I'm talking uh, to, to the, it promotes decentralization. All these four policies or programs or interventions promote decentralization, strengthen good governance, contribute to environmental conservation, and ensure urban sustainability. It's this context, probably I'll take a few minutes. 74th Amendment, I don't want to go into details because there's a separate uh, topic on this. Well, it provided a constitutional status. No, please. Provide a constitutional status. Friends, I have uh, the fortune or misfortune of getting, uh, had some association in the formulation of the 74th Amendment Act also, between 1889 to 1992. So I know a little bit more of what was happening, what happened then, how it was formulated, and how it is being implemented even today. Second is, on some areas, 74th Amendment has done better, say for example, Basically, it was a political aspect and governance aspects. Political aspects has taken a little bit of, little bit, I mind you, I'm using words carefully, little bit of uh, advancement has taken place. But on governance aspect, other aspects, implementation, practically there's nothing we'll probably discuss. Now, it provided a fixed term to local bodies. It requires reservations to women, SCs and STs. Earlier it was there, but one or two, not percent. But numbers, one SC will be there, one ST will be there, maybe one, uh, they are nominated in some cases, not even, but it is provided. Second is what committee is a disaster, to say the least, about which I'll spend a little time, a little later. State finance commissions and state uh, election commissions, probably election commissions are doing a little be better. State finance commissions, I think it was Prasad who said, uh, central government is not interested in uh, delegating to local bodies, not state government. I marginally refine Prasad, Prasad that uh, central government is interested in reforms in local government, but it's not the state which is not interested <laughs> because states lose, uh, central government loses nothing by reforms at the local level. It's the states who lose, therefore it's the state government which do not uh, uh, take interest in local. 74th Amendment Act is the uh, outcome of the central initiative. Probably, if you go back and see this uh, 74th Amendment Act, when in the discussions in the parliament, if you go through, it was the non-Congress governments which opposed, at that point of time, when Rajiv Gandhi was there, uh, Prime Minister, non-Congress non governments which opposed the tooth and nail about autonomy of states, et cetera, et cetera. But when implementation come, came, it was those states which implemented first, West Bengal. 
Andhra Pradesh. Then Congress parties were not in power. Somebody else was there. I mean, they realized the sequence, uh, imp importance. Well, then, SFCs only uh, yesterday, uh, and that is on Friday, we have submitted the report of a, a State Finance Commission to the Ch government of Chhattisgarh, State Finance Commission. We, we wrote the uh, part of the uh, urban part of the report. No state is serious in appointing State Finance Commissions. No state. This is being repeatedly spoken about, but nobody bothers. Friends in Andhra Pradesh, where uh, this university is located, the third finance commission was appointed in some 2005 or six. They submitted a report in 2008. The government has not opened the pages of the report even today. That means it is the local bodies which are losing. Local bodies are being paid the grants from two, the second finance commission report, but nobody bothered. No local body is bothered. No minister is bothered. No MLA is bothered because for them state local bodies is not an important. Similarly, uh, state election commission. Reservations have to be taken care of. By, but in some states, the power is not given to the state election commission. State government kept itself, yeah. like in Andhra Pradesh. Elsewhere, it's given to state election commission. Some kind of a, uh, some, 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 some aspect of uh, uh, serious thinking was going on. Second is, one problem with reservations is, reservations among women is to be rotated among the, uh, among the wards. In most states, they said only one term. Second term, we rotate it. Some seriously minded women corporators or counselors in different parts of the country with whom we have interacted, has occasion to interact. He said, sir, we are doing some good work, but when rotation takes place, I can't contest from the same ward. I have to go elsewhere. The good work I have done in this ward is lost. And they are not contesting again. That means the pur 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 purpose of empowering the women by giving them one third reservation is totally lost in this process. But no state, except Tamil Nadu, to the best of my knowledge, I think, which has two terms. Now, friends, during the, in the, between 1889 to 92, when the 74th Amendment Act was under uh, discussion, I raised the issue at, nation, at the national level at different points. We are talking about only political dimensions, but how about governance aspects? Then the government of India said, I mean, Ministry of Urban Development, Professor, you don't raise these issues now. We'll have 65th, 66th Amendment Act, because originally it was 65th Amendment Act converted into 74. They practically dissuaded me from raising the issue repeatedly. Even if I decide, ultimately it's the government which, uh, which finalizes. We raise the issue. How about governance? They said, no, political is priority. Therefore, we have gone through. So still it continues. Well, friends, Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission is uh, an important uh, program, which is not only, which started as a 60, 70 thousand crores were given to the local bodies, urban local bodies. But thinking that 74th Amendment Act is not being passed, is not being implemented effectively, they concentrate, they talk about 23 reforms to be, governance reforms to be implemented. 23 reforms. Now they deal with decentralization. So friends, in 92, 1992, 74th Amendment Act was passed. Implementation is an important reform to be brought in 2005-6. Community participation law, decentralization. Public disclosure law, I should know what municipality is doing these reforms were brought. Well, next. Well, these things again, I don't have to go into re all these reforms, aid for sustainability, participation, and so on and so forth. Well, friends, I'll get back to this little letter. Maybe 13th Finance Commission is one, is a constitutional body, all of you are aware. First time in India, 12th Finance Commission gave 5,000 crores to the urban local bodies in India, but 13th Finance Commission given almost 23,000 crores to urban local bodies five times roughly increased investments. But they said, we'll give these grants, one third of the grants, conditional to government of uh, state, uh, local bodies doing something. They include local body ombudsman, property tax board, and electronic transfer of uh, grants. See, some of the grants coming from the state uh, government of India are being held up by the state government for months and months and months. 
one municipality told me, one corporation, 100 crores grants are pending in the state government, they are not being released. Well, so this is one more. Friends, here the crux of the problem. We have been having little bit of programs, funds are available, 70,000 crores, but what has been the implementation? State level reforms which are talking, implementation is very, very weak. So for example, public disclosure law is not enacted, is enacted only in 40, 41% of the local bodies in the country. Community part special law is in 35. That means the, if you look at these percentages, how the reforms are being implemented, governance is taking shape in these countries, in these states. If you look at it, state, uh, urban level, local body level reforms, again the same problem, you don't find. Except earmarking funds is the only one reform which has taken little shape. They're allocating money. I have visited roughly 15 states in the country, maybe a large number of local bodies, to examine this particular aspect. Every state and every local body allocates money, we are allocating 200 crores, 300 crores. In Mumbai, Greater Mumbai Corporation, they said, we have allocated 400 crores for the poor. I asked them, can I give an action plan? I am yet to get it after six months after my visit. So plan is there, allocation, allocation is there, but no. Well, friends, this is the e-governance. Accounting reforms, low level of. Same is the case, optional reforms. I don't have to go into greater details. Well, friends, sector-wise allocations. This is a problem. You can go. State-wise projects are allocated. Now question is, under JNRM, 70,000 crores were allocated, as I said. That is Government of India uh, grant, but state and local body included. It comes to about 120 crores, uh, uh, more than uh, a lakh crores. But how they are implemented projects is the question. Well, look at it. On Andhra Pradesh, 52 projects were given, only 20 were completed. Why? Same is the case to all the states. Look at the state, that is Maharashtra. 80 projects were given, but only 30, uh, I think 27 projects are completed after seven years. That means at the national level, if you take entirely, of the 1,400 projects that are given costing about uh, 1.2 lakh crores of rupees, 35% is the execution after seven years of project and capacity being supported, et cetera, et cetera. This is same is the case in difference. We don't have to go into. Well, only 1,400 projects completed is only less than 500. Oh, okay, we don't have to go into this. Now you talk about decentralization, this theme of the seminar. I think the 12th schedule finance functions Give the local bodies functions, the 74th Amendment Act. Several states are yet to do it. Red speaks, they have not done it. City must be associated with its own planning process. They have not done it. Several states have done it. Now look at the governance, e-governance, accounting reforms. You look at the reds, most of the states have not been undertaking reforms, thereby indicating governance is weak. Same is the case sustainability. Friends, rainwater harvesting is a, a reform. It should have been a, a part of the, our philosophy or culture, but then I have visited, as I said, 15, 16 states. Mind you, you don't find any red anywhere. But what has happened was, most states have passed laws, no state is implementing them. Classic example is my own state, Andhra Pradesh. Pa law was passed. Passed. No building permission is given unless the uh, rainwater harvesting structures are there. But no house has these structures. That means sustainability is zero. Same is case reuse of re recycled water. Welcome to governance, friends. We talk about urban cities, they are not performing. Look at the agencies working on city government. 
There are a large number of agencies bring pressure on local government. Political parties, governments, MLAs, MPs, NGOs, civil society, groups, media, business, everybody. But reforms in urban governance, except a few marginal changes now and then, remain as they, it used to be from Ripon's days. Even today, Madras Municipalities Act of 1920 is in operation in Madras and as well as Andhra Pradesh. Kerala is the only government, I think one of, one of some other state, Punjab, I think, has changed the entire municipal system in 1994. An opportunity was taken, but no state has taken. Some changes like the State Election Commission and State Finance Commission. Same is the case when Jainjaram has come, they brought the uh, ward committees, but they are not non-functional. Well, friends, for, for 13 Finance Commission, one or two institutions are added. But none of these things are functional. Here questions comes, final aspect, that is sustainability. If there are no policies, programs are there, but they are not being implemented, services are not delivered, governance is weak, where is sustainability? Sustainability, I don't go, Professor already said that uh, uh, conserving from today to future. I'm not talking about that dimension yet. I talk about the sustainability of the services that are being delivering. These three have some, some of the activities. Ward committees are aimed at decentralization. Functional domain decentralization, CP law, some of these things are decentralized. This is how these three important interventions in India so far address the decentralization, good governance, but implementation is weak. Friends, to meet the backlog of urban uh, uh, service delivery gaps and to meet the future, it is estimated by a committee recently with which we are also associated, 40 lakh crores are required. Including operational expenditure, it requires more than 60 lakh crores. And as I said, one po a little over a lakh crores was uh, spent, were given, implementation is practically zero. 35% was implemented. If we are cannot implement the program, the projects which are given, with 35% is the uh, execution rate, if we are getting 40 lakh crores from somewhere, some godfather gives us some money, some money, maybe today everybody looks at World Bank or IMF, but how do you implement them? And how do, how, how, what is the outcome of the implementation? Not implementation is one outcome of implementation. I have seen several projects. Reservoirs are constructed, but the distribution lines are not there. Similarly, if you look at in the investments, in UK they invest about $1,700 per capita on urban infrastructure. In South Africa, they invest about a little over $500 per, per capita. In China, it's about 360 or so. And in India, it is 60. Chronic underinvestment. How do you expect? When no money is there, in several municipalities, councillors ask us, what do we do? We're giving all the money, and we're giving all the money, and we're giving Tanka contractor, nothing else in between. Now, one more a study has shown, I can see, they said we need 2.2 trillion rupees. Mind you, this money is required next 20 years. As per some, some standards of uh, delivery of services. 2.2 trillion means I don't know how much to calculate it. I understand it's a little over 1.2 lakh crores. Well, we need for two things. One is capital expenditure, second is uh, uh, operational expenditure. We spend, ma most of the municipalities are interested in bringing capital expenditure, because contractors. Operational expenditure maintenance is zero. Well, we have to mobilize resources through internally and externally. Mind you, look at it. Property tax is the only source which provides 30 to 40% of municipal revenues. Well, in Mumbai, it is, uh, demand is uh, 3,000, and collection is 1,300. In Mumbai, and percentage of delivery uh, collection is 39%. It is 2,607. But in partner, it's only 47 and uh, 25. 
if you look at some of these stats explain, property tax ceased to be an important revenue. Nobody would like to re re uh, uh, tax the people. Well, if you look at this, the, in developed countries, it is 2.1% uh, of the GDP is the in, uh, property tax revenues. But in India, it is 0.25%. Well, we can do good governance, can be, through number of reforms which we have discussed. Remove discussion, but discussion is there everywhere. File goes to the minister and small, small things. Small, small things. Giving of a five lakh rupees in Chhattisgarh has to go to the minister. Five lakh rupees for a, uh, construction of a, a toilets in a slum area, it has to go to the minister. I can just couldn't. Here's some of those reforms which you have talked about. Well, I don't go into details because there are discussions on transparency and accountability, how it can be done. Okay, now, there are some efforts in different parts of the country in terms of ensuring accountability. Not that nothing is happening when I said so much. Well, there are a uh, number of case studies are there, good examples are there. Well, friends, the most important problem is capacities capacities of local bodies. So to say the least, there is no capacities. Professionalism is not there as I meant. We have been talking about it. And there are no institutions to build the capacities of local bodies. In the entire country, there are only two states which have urban institutions. One is uh, Tamil Nadu, which is not functioning. Second is Karnataka, which is functional. And partly, of course, in every state has some institutions. An engineer, after 35 years of service, whatever he learned in the school or college is the only knowledge that he has with him, despite changes in technology, changes in governance, etc., etc. Well, friends, this is the status of we need to, this is, if we want good governance, we want decentralization and sustainability, we need to take urban system seriously at least now. Not that 30% are urban, but it is likely to be 50% in the next couple of decades. 40% next couple of decades, 50% uh, in the next three or four decades. Policy is to be articulated, governance needs to be improved, and so on and so forth. And most important is, the capacity of the municipal personnel. But unfortunately, so far, no effort is being made. Government of India has allocated 150, 150 crores to different states for capacity building. There are no states to take them. In one state, a 10 crores was given. They spent money to site visits, tourism, rather than for building the capacities. Long ago, it was 15 years back, I made a proposal for the uh, establishing a national issue of urban, develop, urban governance in Hydra, at Hyderabad. But it took 20 years to fructify. For the last three years, land is given, institution is not there. Funds are allocated. Friends, the question is, it's not that money is not available. Money is available. But it is the governance that matters. Now, local bodies do not have the powers Decentralization is weak. No state, community participation law speaks, every ward must have a community, sorry, uh, ward committee with people elected, except West Bengal and Karnataka, Kerala, nowhere it's working. It's the question is, how we do improve governance? How bring policies in place? And between the one policy and other policy, there is no relationship and how to develop professionalism, bring professionalism into urban systems before we think of sustainability. Friends, sustainability is far away. This is where I think universities can play a, a, a substantial role, except a couple of universities. Most, in, most universities, as I said in the beginning, urban is not part of a uh, uh, curriculum, either in political science, public administration, or economics, or any other social science disciplines. Instantly, we are talking about it. We need to talk about it now. If 
30% of India is not being discussed in our classrooms, which is likely to be 50% in the next few years. What are we discussing? It cannot be ivory terms. Slums. Slums. Now, the census has, uh, has said services are available to 80% uh, of the people. I am doubtful. Therefore, universities can undertake serious studies. Mr. Vice Chancellor, without taking much time, state universities, we have serious problems of funds, uh, boards, uh, commissions, this and that. Central universities, I think, <laughs> are better placed. Maybe Central University State Initiative to start an interdisciplinary urban, urban uh, maybe center, whatever name you give. This I have been talking for the last 10, 15 years. Maybe since you have taken the initiative to organize a seminar of national type bringing from different universities, maybe it's time you also take the initiative to have a, a, a center for urban studies and start researching, making undertaking studies and advising the governments at center and states to follow what they can do. Certainly, whether they follow it or not, but it will be given consideration by the government. Well, friends, I don't go take much of, I have already taken much of time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I wish the proceedings of the seminar successful and academically rewarding. Thank you.